it's really important to understand the background of the history of the state of Israel, uh, the background of Palestine and, and other areas um, in the region. Because if you don't understand all that, uh, it, it's easy to deceive you and to make you a follower of a certain uh, policy that, well, may be the wrong policy. It's especially important to be unclouded by ideology and uh, to focus on the uh, important aspects of imperialism and uh, the intelligence world. So some people tend to believe that um, uh, Jewish people received um, the red carpet treatment by the British, but the reality is far more grim than that. The British colonial empire was heavily involved um, in the Palestine region and uh, further into the, the Arab region. Jews were far less important uh, to the British than the Muslim partners in the region. And uh, to many people in Israel, uh, there is a, a sense of uh, great betrayal. So there was no other choice but to uh, work with the British. But uh, this, um, this old trauma persists to this day. A lot of people mistrust uh, the British. And this, of course, led to uh, an increase in uh, Soviet Russian influence um, over Israel, especially through espionage, but also through the socialist um, ideology. Um, especially the KGB uh, used to uh, push that line that uh, Russia had mainly uh, defeated the Nazis and therefore Israelis owe a great debt uh, to the Russians. This became, of course, really, really dangerous in Israeli history. Uh, a recent book on the matter is called Statecraft by Stealth. It tries to be very scientific and very fair. However, it's, uh, it's too friendly towards the British and it tries to um, explain the whole situation. So during World War I, uh, Britain's enemies were Germany, the German Empire and the Turkish Ottoman Empire. Now the Turks originally were not even Muslims, but they had converted to Islam. At some point, the Turks uh, dominated the Islamic world. And so uh, during World War I, it was not clear what the future would be of uh, the Germans and uh, the Turkish Ottomans. So um, ultimately, the, the Germans and the Ottomans, uh, their empires failed. They imploded, um, but that was not foreseeable uh, before World War I or during World War I. So that was the main topic, fight the Germans and fight the Turks. And uh, for that reason, Britain, uh, Britain in the region supported uh, Muslim Arabs and also Zionists. And this was, uh, these were forces directed against the Turks. So it's important for the British to keep out the French in the region. The French would have liked to uh, take over Egypt and become more of an imperial power again. There was a pointed statement from the Russian Emperor Nicholas II that the Franco-French-Russian alliance applied only to Europe and that Russia would not go to war against Britain for the sake of, let's say, an obscure fort in the Sudan in which no Russian interests were involved. Very early on, Britain had sent its experts uh, into the region, such as Herbert Kitchener, a member of the Privy Council. At the start of the First World War, Kitchener became Secretary of State for War. And back in 1874, aged 24 years old, Kitchener was assigned by the Palestine Exploration Fund to a mapping survey of the Holy Land, which is a euphemism for espionage. So they wanted to uh, understand the territory and the people and how all this information can be used. This uh, serves, serves as a basis for the grid system used in the modern maps of Israel and Palestine. Uh, he took part in the reconstruction of the Egyptian army. Egypt had become a British puppet state, its army led by British officers. Uh, Sir Evelyn Baring, the real British ruler of Egypt, uh, thought Kitchener the most able soldier I have come across in my time. 
Mr. Baring was also a member of the Privy Council, and uh, he is tied to the infamous Baring's Bank. Uh, the family was originally from Hannover in Germany. Um, some of the uh, main aristocratic families in Germany uh, were also attached to the British throne. Um, several modern kings of Britain came originally from Hannover, and uh, in Hannover there was a tradition of recruiting certain families and turning them into privileged, uh, trusted families such as the Bearings. While in Egypt, Kitchener was initiated into Freemasonry, and uh, then he was appointed the first district Grand Master of the District Grand Lodge of Egypt and the Sudan, of course, under the United Grand Lodge of England. Then we had Mark Sykes, key negotiator for the Balfour Declaration. It was Sykes's intelligence that informed the Foreign Office that Turkey would fight alongside Germany. The Foreign Office then set up the Arab Bureau in Cairo in January of 1916. Sykes designed the flag of the Arab Revolt. Variations of this became uh, the flags of Jordan, Iraq, Syria, Egypt, Sudan, Kuwait, Yemen, United Arab Emirates, and Palestine. Sykes had agreed with the traditional policy of British conservatives in propping up the Ottoman Empire. Uh, initially, the Turks as a buffer against Russian expansion into the Mediterranean, but then the policy uh, shifted. Um, then there was this. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. But it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which, which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of, rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. So this was, of course, uh, paradoxical, uh, very vague. So the intention of creating uh, a Jewish state. But of course, um, Britain did not want to alienate uh, its uh, Muslim allies in the region. So the Brits made all kinds of promises uh, towards uh, Jewish people, Arabs and the French. And uh, then Turkey collapsed and Germany collapsed. Britain wanted to control Palestine and uh, there were more more or less puppet regimes um, in the Arab sphere, Syria, Iraq and so on. And these puppet rulers, these Muslim puppet rulers were supposed to have autonomy within their own state, but they should not have autonomy in foreign policy. So the entire field of foreign policy was supposed to go through the British. And uh, these Arab puppet states, Muslim puppet states, they were under uh, much, much surveillance by the British to uh, make sure that the loyalty was intact. Kaim Weizmann tried as hard as he could to uh, convince the British that uh, there should be a uh, there should be a strong uh, strong Israel and there should be uh, quite a bit of uh, migration. Um, by Jewish people. So uh, Kaim Weizmann tried to uh, make contact with influential people. For example, he had a meeting with uh, uh, Dorothy de Rothschild, her husband James de Rothschild, or um, as the English-speaking world uh, calls him Rothschild. Um, of course, the, the banking family was uh, influential, but ultimately even the Rothschilds were under the control of the British crown and the extended, uh, under control of the extended aristocracy, which was quite large, especially those um, families of German origin. Um, uh, James de Rothschild advised Weizmann to seek influence, uh, to seek to influence the British government. By the time he reached Lord Robert Cecil, uh, Mr. Weizmann was very enthusiastic. Uh, in 1936, there was an evacuation plan which called for the evacuation of 1.5 million Jews from Poland, the Baltic States, Nazi Germany, Hungary and Romania to Palestine over the span of the next 10 years. A uh, plan was proposed and um, the immigration would take 10 years. Um, that was the initial plan. However, the British government vetoed the plan and the World Zionist Organization's chairman, Kaim Weizmann, 
also had to dismiss it. In 1942, the Zionists met in New York, a convention at which Weizmann pressed for a policy of unrestricted immigration into Palestine. And by immigration, uh, this basically meant refugees, um, of course, as the Holocaust was raging. Um, unfortunately, this uh, evacuation did not happen. The British had uh, to negotiate with the um, Arab states, uh, the Arab kingdoms, and uh, to not alienate the Arabs, um, the plan for uh, th this plan for uh, Jewish refugees, uh, this plan was uh, ended. And there was another problem, the communists. So quite a few communists um, reached uh, a foothold in the region uh, in the 1920s and in the 1930s. Uh, there was even an international Zionist Socialist Party. And uh, Robert Van Sattard warned Lord Curzon about this. And uh, so there was this, uh, this fear that many Jews would uh, become socialists. In 1924, there was a raid in Tel Aviv, and uh, this turned up quite a bit of um, intelligence. So there was a strong communist presence in uh, Palestine. And so the communists, they wanted to recruit Jewish people and Muslim people. Uh, the Brits had a, a relationship with the Zionists uh, in Palestine, so um, Zionists were needed for intelligence gathering, and it was always a quid pro quo. Unfortunately, there was never a free lunch, so the, the Jewish people, they had to supply the Brits with valuable information, um, otherwise the situation would have become even more dangerous for the Jewish people. Um, and so uh, Jewish groups started to increasingly arm themselves and there was more illegal uh, Jewish migration. And uh, this infuriated the Arabs and there was this Arab revolt. And the Saudis uh, especially, uh, the, the, the Saudis which then became Saudi Arabia, uh, they were against the Jews so the Brits got together with the Saudis and other Arab kings. And so the consensus was that uh, uh, in order to create some sort of order in Palestine, uh, to have relative peace in Palestine, uh, therefore um, the, the Jewish hopes uh, must be squashed. 1939 saw the infamous White Paper which limited uh, Jewish migration uh, down to almost nothing. And the declaration stated that, well, this is now the, the new Jewish home, so everybody should be happy about that. The British Royal Navy even opened fire on illegal refugee boats, uh, especially uh, during the Holocaust. So this is how crazy this was. And uh, today's historians, with the newly available uh, files that were being looked at, um, of course, there's an attempt to uh, shift the blame as much as possible, protect Britain's image, um, blame the Muslims, of course, and uh, of course, they deserve uh, quite a bit of uh, blame in this one. The Jews, uh, from a source, learned that um, Britain was um, Britain was heavily betraying the Jews in the region uh, more than was was already publicly known, and uh, this situation was later confirmed by French intelligence uh, and uh, more recently also confirmed by CIA declassified CIA files. Uh, people in Israel are more aware of this history outside of Israel. Most people are completely unaware of this. And uh, so th there was no other choice um, to trust the Brits, to work with the Brits, but there was this deep-seated uh, mistrust. Um, so um, eventually the British haggled out a deal. We saw the creation of Israel. Um, but um, there was a huge problem from the beginning, and that was an intelligence problem. So 
Israel became a state, but uh, quite a few Israelis came from the Soviet Union. Um, there was a certain number of uh, spies involved. Um, other Israelis were socialists. They believed in the socialist idea. And um, quite a few Israelis um, hated the British. And so some Israelis, they thought it wise uh, to align themselves with Russia instead, which is, of course, a very, very dangerous choice. Now, the British essentially... Um, the British essentially had uh, access to all the Israeli uh, intelligence. A uh, big additional problem was that Britain itself was severely compromised. Um, you know, this this became very visible with the Cambridge spies, uh, guys like Kim Philby, who gave all these big secrets to the Russians, and also the atomic spies, um, agents such as Klaus Fuchs, who worked on the British nuclear program. Uh, in the beginning, and then Fuchs was moved to the United States to the Manhattan Project. And British intelligence assured the Americans that Mr. Fuchs was safe, that he was vetted properly, which wasn't the case. And so all these atomic secrets uh, ended up with the Russians. And this was one of the biggest intelligence failures in history. And there's a whole lot more to this, and I, I've explained this in, in videos already, and I will... Uh, explain more about that in future videos. So there was no reason really to trust the Brits. If Israeli secrets ended up with Britain, these secrets potentially ended up with the Russians. So now paranoia has broken out in Israel. The security authorities are said to have failed to foresee the massive coordinated attack by Hamas. Uh, one of the country's largest newspapers accuses Netanyahu of ignoring a warning from Egyptian intelligence. Experts assume that Hamas completely refrained from using electronic communication during its preparations. Central problem is the infiltration of Israel by Russian secret services. Uh, and the Russians, the Russians at the same time, promote and to a certain extent control the Palestinian groups. Uh, you had, for example, Shimon Levinson, who was a senior Israeli intelligence officer who was arrested in 1991 for spying for the Soviet Union, one of the highest ranking KGB moles in Israel. Um, so he joined Shin Bet in 1963, and he was transferred to the Mossad. And in 1983, Levinson entered the Soviet em embassy in Bangkok and offered to spy for the KGB. And his motivation was money, uh, ultimately. And he delivered all kinds of sensitive um, information uh, to the Russians. And um, eventually, he was arrested. Uh, his cellmate became a certain Marcus Klingberg, one of the most devastating espionage scandals in the history of the state of Israel. He was an expert on medical topics, and he had studied in the Eastern Bloc. In 1957, he joined the secret Israel Institute for Biological Research, which was also involved in uh, biological warfare. And um, yeah, he sold all kinds of secrets to the Russians. In an interview in 2014, he said he felt like he owed the Russians something for saving the world from the Nazis. He said he had always been a communist and recruited even his wife, Wanda, and two friends. He was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Uh, then you had a, a infamous uh, KGB spy ring. Uh, included politicians, senior IDF officers, engineers, members of the in intelligence community, and others working on secret projects. Uh, there was a Soviet defector, Vasily Mitrokhin. Uh, he uh, defected to the West and brought with him quite a bit of files. And so this ring was then exposed. Then, according to research by an Israeli broadcaster, Mahmoud Abbas, president of the Palestinians, is said to have worked for the Soviet secret service uh, as far back as the 1980s. Um, the Palestine Liberation Organization, PLO, and Abbas maintained close relations with the Soviet Union during the Cold War. PLO founder Yasser Arafat had already been received in Moscow at the end of the 1960s. Uh, and then you had Operation SIG by the Soviets. 
Soviets launched a comprehensive covert campaign against Israel that included propaganda, as well as direct military support to terrorist groups that declared Israel their enemy. The USSR decided to increase anti-Israel sentiment by spreading anti-Zionist propaganda. And this extended to the entire world, especially uh, Europe and the United States. So the propaganda was always the same. Former KGB chairman Yuri Andropov said, We just have to keep repeating our thesis that the United States and Israel are fascists, imperial Zionist countries financed by rich Jews. And then you get books like KGB and Soviet Disinformation and Insider's View by Ladislav Bittman. And then there's the book Disinformation by General Ion Mihai Pachepa, also a defector. And in those books, you can get quite a bit more details. Um, according to Pachepa, the KGB had selected Yasser Arafat, KGB trained Arafat at uh, Special Forces School Balashika, east of Moscow. And in the mid-1960s, decided to train him to become a future PLO leader. Um, so... Um, the Metrochin documents say that the KGB began recruiting Mahmoud Abbas around 1979 when he arrived in Moscow for graduate studies. And um, these uh, Palestinian leaders became quite greedy. Many Palestinians believe the Palestinian authorities are corrupt. In 1977, Zahir Muhsein, member of the executive committee of the Palestine Liberation Organization, admitted in an interview with a Dutch newspaper uh, the Palestinian people do not exist. The creation of Palestine state is only a means of continuing our fight against the state of Israel for our Arab unity. In reality, today, there is no difference between Jordanians, Palestinians, Syrians and Lebanese. Only for political and tactical reasons do we speak today of the existence of a Palestine people to oppose Zionism. If you understand the whole backstory, if you take a look at the map, you will understand um, that uh, this description is accurate. So Palestinians do not care what their passport says, if they're this is a Palestine state or if, if it's uh, Jordan or, or Syrian or Lebanese. They, they really don't care. The oldest academic journal to identify Arab Palestinians as a people was the Journal of Palestine Studies, founded in 1972, five years after the Soviet Operation SIG began. U.S. Special Envoy to the Middle East, Jason Greenblatt, is quoted as saying the Palestinian Authority pays more than $13 million a month for terrorists. David Mayalevi writes, Arafat was particularly impressed by Ho Chi Minh's success at uh, mobilizing the leftists worldwide. Left-wing sympathizers in Europe and the United States were activists, uh, activists at American universities, enthusiastically followed the propaganda line of no North Vietnamese activists. They were reframing the Vietnam War from a communist attack on the South into a struggle for national liberation. Arafat and his lieutenants said, that they too would have to redefine the framing of their struggle to be successful. So, for Israel, it's about survival. That is the realistic goal. Uh, for various different Muslim states, um, the near-term goals are uh, just solidifying the situation in those individual states. And at some point, they seek to have some sort of Arab-Muslim unity. Uh, Especially now, you can see the uh, Iranian influence uh, over Hamas and uh, Iran feels it is under pressure because of this deal that uh, Israel uh, Israel was seeking with uh, the United States and the Saudis. And uh, yeah, then you have the American interests and you have the Russian interests. So obviously the Americans, they want uh, many pro-Western uh, Muslim countries, and uh, the Americans, they also want a pro-USA Israel. The Russians, uh, on their side, they want a pro-Russian Arab state. Um, but in the end, uh, the status of the superpowers uh, is way more important to them than anything else. So um, at the end, this is kind of the core interest. So not to lose that superpower uh, status and um, even the Cold War expert um, Professor Carol Quigley uh, wrote uh, about sixty years ago that this le this leads to a very peculiar dynamic between the superpowers. So um, uh, if these smaller wars break out, 
um, the superpowers can always influence those conflicts. They can prolong these conflicts, they can uh, shorten them, they can end them. And, um, and uh, uh, there's also the threat, the public threat, uh, which is also voiced by the superpowers that there could be a big world war and total annihilation. So this also serves as a way to um, calm things down if the superpowers wish to do so. And uh, this is sort of a, a brake pedal next to the gas pedal. So there's always the option to force different uh, smaller players uh, to come to some sort of an agreement. Professor Quigley feared that the superpowers uh, do not really intend to have a mega war and they do not really intend uh, seek to be super successful with all these uh, smaller states. Um, but instead, it's always about the interests of the superpowers themselves. And by having these smaller wars break out, uh, Russia, especially Russia and the United States, they can keep their status and uh, keep everybody else busy, especially the normal countries and, and uh, general population. And of course, there's always a threat of a major world war. So everybody should read up on this history and understand the way empires work and how they interact and how they use intelligence. It doesn't matter if you're Christian or Jewish or Muslim. Uh, you should be aware um, of how these things work and what would be in your interests and um, of other people's interests.